Hi, good morning. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the third edition of the Prajna Agenda Talks, which for almost 10 years were called the Prajna Women's History Roundtable Series. Uh, I'm also delighted to welcome my friend, Dr. Priya Pillay, to be a speaker on this series, something that would have been impossible in our pre digital avatar because she lives in Manila. Uh, we have long tweeted and Skyped and said we must do something together. Well, this is the beginning of that something, Priya. And I'm so pleased to have you here. Also to speak about a topic that is really important to me and to Prajna as an organization, we've tried despite our location and what, we, what you might consider a non-conflict area, We've tried almost every single year in our 16 days campaign to include something on militarization and sexual violence and conflict. So it's really important to us that we are able to include a proper solid full length talk on this as part of our uh, gender talk series. I want to introduce uh, Priya to you formally. Um, I'm going to read out her bio. Dr. Priya Pillay is an international lawyer with two decades of experience in the areas of international and transitional justice, human rights, and humanitarian issues. Priya has previously worked in various national and international institutions, including at a UN court, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, as well as at the Fe International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies headquarters in Geneva. She's a contributing editor at the International Law Blog, Opinio Juris. She holds a PhD in International Law from the Graduate Institute, Geneva, a master's from NYU, and her first law degree from the National Law School, Bangalore. And um, she's been writing recently about the case against, the Gambian case against Myanmar and the Rohingya refugees. and. Um, if you have to read one person on this topic to get caught up, I would say it would be Priya. So uh, with this, I'm gonna hand over to you and disappear and mute myself. And I'm really excited about this, Priya, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Swarna, for this wonderful introduction. And of course, the, the invitation to speak on this topic and you know to, to have a discussion on, on really something that is a very critical area and and an aspect of, you know, an area of concern that we all need to think about and do more about. So I'm, I'm very grateful for this opportunity as well. And I just want to thank you and your organization for this, uh, you know, incredible opportunity to speak to people and reach out to more people. And as you say, you know, it's wonderful to have this option as well with all the, the pressures of COVID, you know, to, to adapt and use these new forms of communication. And, and again, for that, I'm, I'm very grateful of this, for this opportunity. Um, what I will do now is share my screen. I've prepared a presentation just to help us walk through, you know, the, the multiple components of this area. I won't be able to go into a great deal of in-depth analysis on each of these aspects, but this is really to just give you a sense or a flavor of you know, how we approach um, conflict-related sexual violence in international law broadly. And then we'll, we'll pick up on a few aspects, I'm sure, in the discussion moving forward. So let me just put the uh, presentation up. Um, is that okay for everybody? I hope you can see my screen and have the presentation in front of you. Okay. Yes, it's fine. Thanks, Rana. So I think just, you know, again, to frame the topic, we're talking about impunity for sexual and gender-based violence or conflict-related sexual violence in international law. And what I'd like to do in this talk today is walk you through certain aspects of the international legal framework, a little bit of the context and where we are today in the way international law approaches this uh, topic. And you know, what are the means of accountability? Is, is there still impunity? And is that something that's been chipped away? Have we made a lot of progress over the years? And, and where are we right now? So I think that's going to be the, the trajectory of this talk, really. I think just in terms of context, you know, I, uh, the, the background is that sexual violence in conflict 
is really not new. It's not something that has been, you know, uh, brought to the fore in recent years. This is something that has been happening for a very, very long time. And it continues to be a huge problem. It's not something that's gone away or reduced with the evolving nature of conflict or the types of wars that are going on. So this is very much a huge problem. In terms of the fact that it is underreported, even in normal quote unquote circumstances, you can imagine that this would be even more exacerbated during a conflict. And I think at this point, you know, I, I think it is uh, important to just pause and reflect on the fact that when we're talking about normal circumstances, I mean, in India right now, there's a case in UP, in Uttar Pradesh, which is horrifying and I think has really been in the spotlight as well. And I think this is just to indicate how prevalent this is as a problem in terms of sexual and gender-based violence and the intersection with discrimination, with impunity and with the ability to carry out these atrocities. So, you know, even in, in quote unquote normal circumstances, this is a, a massive undertaking to even report it without huge repercussions on family members to varying degrees, depending on the jurisdiction that you're in. But so you can also imagine that in the context of an active conflict or post-conflict scenario, how difficult it is again to, you know, um, articulate or even have these crimes be recognized, acknowledged and dealt with as well. I think in terms of historical roots, it's been, you know, I, I think when you, you chart the trajectory of many conflicts over the years, over, you know, multiple conflicts over the years, it's really, in many cases, been used as a weapon of war, as a tool to subjugate entire populations, not just the individuals who are the victims of these atrocities, but it's a tool to subjugate and control, you know, populations that have either been occupied or in terms of the, the you know, it's seen as a spoil of war or a victory of war. So that's really also been a, a part and parcel of this um, series of, of crimes that have occurred over multiple conflicts over many, many years as well. And I think what we see now is Traditional conflicts, and I use you know the word traditional to mean perhaps interstate conflicts. We've had the occurrence or the use of, of rape and sexual violence as a weapon of war, but also increasingly in internal armed conflicts now. So you can look at multiple conflicts across the world where sexual violence is a key sort of driver and is a, a, a way that is is part and parcel of the way that that conflict is, is being run as well. So I think that's something that we need to keep in mind as a bit of the broader context of, of these, these crimes and violations. In terms of the ambit of what we're talking about, so, and I've, I've uh, you know, paraphrased a little bit from one of the international legal texts that we look at subsequently, but it's a very wide ambit of crimes. So it would include um, rape, sexual enslavement, trafficking, forced prostitution, forced pregnancy, sterilization, and other acts of sexual violence of comparable gravity. So again, it's a fairly wide scope, and we've got a number of act actions that can come within the scope of what we mean or what we're looking at when we, when we talk about conflict-related sexual violence. At this point, I'll just point out um, a few of the important UN Security Council resolutions, which again, I'm sure many of you are aware of in the context of women, peace and security and how they relate also to the commission of these atrocities. So of course you have the seminal UN you know, Security Council resolution 1325, which was passed in 2000. And we're of course coming up to the 20th year, 20 year anniversary of resolution 1325. And you also have resolution 1960, which is 2010, which again focused on involvement of women, looked at the fact that you have these international crimes that have been occurring and that there needs to be more to be done to redress and deal with the, uh, the commission of these crimes. So I think that's sort of a little bit of the, the context and what's, what, what we mean when we talk, talk about some of these international crimes. I think you only have to look around to see what's been happening in the last few years to understand the gravity and the significance of this topic. 
You look at the atrocities against the Yazidi peoples. You look at the abduction and enslavement of the Chibok girls in Nigeria. And of course, more recently, you look at the, the, you know, the atrocities against the Rohingya and the documented um, sexual violence against the Rohingya by the fact-finding mission, which is, you know, again, something that has been um, looked into in, in a great amount of detail and something that deserves a lot more attention as well. So I think there are a lot of instances now in the last few years that have been coming to light as well. And I think, you know, we've just had the Nobel Peace Prize uh, decision yesterday for 2020, but I think 2018, where the prize was given to Nadia Murad, who was a survivor of the uh, Yazidi peoples, and you had Dr. Dennis Mukwege, who has run for years a, a, a hospital that has actually treated thousands of women who have been, you know, um, who have, have been victims of these crimes. And I think 2018, the Nobel Peace Prize was a huge recognition of the fact that they are doing incredible work and that these are issues that need to be discussed and dealt with, with a lot more vigor and that there needs to be a renewed effort in looking at this. So I think the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize was extremely timely in sort of highlighting and, and bringing the spotlight back to the fact that this is happening, it's been happening for a long time, and it still continues to happen. And so maybe we need to act with more urgency and you know address this problem with much more gravity than it's been getting so far. So I think that's just a little bit of, of the context of where we are right now. I'll now take you very briefly to the 11th report of the UN Sec uh, Secretary General on conflict-related sexual violence, which came out in 2020, I think July 2020. And you know what I have on the screen right now is the fact sheet of the 11th report. And this is downloadable from the UN website. You can get the, the report as well as the fact sheet from the website. Um, I think just to highlight the fact that, you know, you it, it brings to your attention what is happening in this context. And, you know, as you can see in the fact sheet, there are 2,838 cases of conflict-related sexual violence here, which actually constitute about 96% of the cases. But you have some cases also with regard to the LGBTIQA uh, community as well. You've got you know, specific, um, specific actions that have been taken. So for instance, you've got sanctioned re regimes that are attempting to address this issue as well. You've got the inclusion of senior women protection advisors as well. So there's, there, this gives you a little bit of a snapshot of what the state is right now and what's been done in selected areas and selected regions. So I would really recommend that, you know, you go and take a look at this report. It's been, this is, as I said, this is the 11th report. So it, this is a, 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 a very good source of information and to understand right now what is happening in the different contexts and different countries that have been highlighted in the report. Um, what I'll do is I'll just very briefly go through some of the aspects that I think are interesting in this report. And, and of course, you know, it's, it's something that, depending on your interest, this is something that you can look at in more detail and, and do a little bit more research as well. But in terms of the findings and some of the recommendations, and if you look at the report, it is per country. So they will, there'll be an analysis of a particular country with recommendations of you know, what needs to be done in that country context. So I won't go into details on each, but I've just extrapolated some of them for you. And, you know, that's something that you can look at in more detail. I mean, the first point, of course, as we know, is the question of underreporting. That this is a type of offense that many are reluctant to talk about for multiple reasons, including, you know, societal pressure, uh, patriarchal notions of honor. So this is this all, you know, adds to the reluctance of survivors, victims and survivors to speak about this and to speak to these crimes and a certain invisibility then of what has happened in the context of many of these conflicts. I think it, it gets also particularly um, complicated when you're looking at peace negotiations and peace agreements that are ongoing. So the, the report talks specifically about accountability for perpetrators in the context of peace negotiations in Afghanistan, in Colombia, in CAR, Central African Republic. So, you know, this is again a, a particular area which brings 
brings to the fore a lot of the WPS discussions which talk about the need for women to be at the table in these peace negotiations and, and articulate the, the perspective that there needs to be accountability as well. So I think this is a really important point that goes, draws back into the WPS agenda and draws back into what is the role of women also in peace negotiations and, and discussions of this nature. I think specifically one very interesting example from DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, was a, a recommendation around legal aid on implementation of legislation within the country that would help um, in the prosecution of these crimes, and as well as something that has become a much more important discussion recently, which is the fact of reparations. And can we look at reparations seriously for victims who have suffered these incredible harms and you know what is the best way to help them as well, help the survivors of these crimes. Um, the other point of course is prosecution of crimes that's been brought up in the context of Iraq and Mali. And you know, let's not forget that, that sexual offenses are also used as weapons against men and boys and the LGBTQIA community as well. And this is again, something that has been highlighted in the report. Other issues include access to detention facilities, such as in Libya, the safe release of women um, in South Sudan, and the implementation of international uh, recommendations from the fact-finding mission from Myanmar, as well as the International Court of Justice provisional measures in Myanmar. And you know, keep in mind that this is something that I will look at in more detail in the course of this uh, discussion. So we will come back to this as well specifically. So I think that's just to give you a little bit of a sense of what this report says, and it's definitely worth delving into further. But I'll now turn to the international legal framework and what we have in terms of international law, international norms, and how that as a system works in terms of accountability or, you know, permitting impunity as well. So let's take a quick look at, at you know, how this system in a way is, is structured and how it works. Of course, the, the first thing I will say is that traditionally a lot of sexual based offenses and violence has not been recognized in, in domestic law and international law. To an extent there's been by law, what I would call legal blindness. So if you look, if you sort of turn back to the Nuremberg trials, post the Second World War, or you look at the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, which tried uh, Japanese perpetrators, perpetrators of atrocities, there really was no mention or reference to the fact that rape was used as a, as a weapon of war. There were no charges, there were no prosecutions. This was not in the law. It was really quite blind in that sense. So, you know, I, I would really refer to it as invisible victims and perpetrators. And I think the the, Implications of this continue to this day in the sense that you've got comfort women who were used and abused by the Japanese military in Southeast Asia, including in Korea, including in the Philippines, who have been struggling now for years for the recognition, acknowledgement, and justice for what has been done to them. And this has really not been acknowledged and not been recognized and it's, it's an ongoing issue right now. And, and you know, I will just highlight the fact that there was a uh, Women's International War Crimes Tribunal on Japan's sexual slavery in 2000, which was modeled along the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, the IMTFE, to address what was left out in the IMTFE. I mean, to, to be clear, this was a civil society uh, uh, approach, and it was organized by civil society, but also a lot of those who took part were lawyers or people who were actually working already at the uh, criminal tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda. So they brought that legal knowledge and awareness as well into this um, war crimes tribunal that would look specifically at the comfort woman issue and you know highlight recommendations of what needed to be done. So I think just to say that there are huge gaps, there were huge gaps in the law and the law really didn't, didn't recognize this area of, of atrocities as either a crime against humanity or a war crime. When you're looking at international law in general, there are a few sort of blocks or areas of law that we need to turn to and look at. 
One, of course, which is the most, you know, um, I think well known is international human rights law. You've got IHL, international humanitarian law, which looks at the laws of war and conduct in the context of a conflict, whether it's an international conflict or a non-international or an internal armed conflict. And then of course, you've got international criminal law, which has now been, um, uh, which has evolved now. And we look at some of the evolution of international criminal law and how it addresses um, sexual violence and conflict related sexual violence. I think very briefly on IHRL, hum human rights law, and, I, and I'm assuming that many of you are more conversant with this already, is of course, we've got the CEDAW obligations, we've got you know, areas that we look to for interpretation, which include general recommendations. And I would point really to one of the early general recommendations, number 19, the Beijing platform for action in terms of how it influences the approach and interpretation of CEDAW. And of course, you've got multiple human rights cases that have looked at uh, gender-based violence, including in the Inter-American Court, European Courts, and the African Court, using the principles of international human rights law. And I think the one thing that I would emphasize is also that this is, IHRL is operational in all contexts, including in armed conflict. So it's not that, you know, these human rights obligations, once there's an armed conflict, um, melt away or don't apply anymore. No, they still do apply, but you also have IHL obligations that would apply in the context of conflict. So let's look quickly at IHL. The foundational sort of um, treaties or conventions in humanitarian law post the Second World War are the 1949 Geneva Conventions, which codify and encapsulate what would be considered war crimes, what would be considered a grave breach, and what should be prosecuted in the context of you know, the violations of the laws of war. I mean, what I will say is that the references are somewhat archaic. They really refer to protection in a way, as you can see, Article 27 of Geneva Convention 4 talks about, you know, protection and attack on the honor of, of women. Um, also, you know, additional protocol two talks about outrages on personal dignity and humiliating treatment. So again, very much from a, a slightly older mindset of, uh, you know, protection and, and a much more patriarchal approach, to be honest. Um, and that these are not what are called grave breaches, which are, you know, extreme violations of, of IHL, of these conventions. So I think good to keep that in mind as well. But let's look really now at the evolution of international criminal law, which I think is where there's been a lot of progress. And, you know, I think the encapsulation of, of the law in this area is very important as well now. So if you look at the evolution of international criminal law, as I've mentioned before, we had the Nuremberg trials, we had the uh, IMTFE, International Military Tribunal for the Far East. Those were really the first war crimes trials, if you will. And of course, there are a lot of, um, you know, there, there are issues around the way that those trials were held. Of course, the discussion around victor's justice, there's, there's all that that we need to address as well. But I think in the context specifically of the post-World War uh, scenario, there was a glaring lack of even acknowledgement or taking on board of what had happened in terms of sexual offenses during the World War. I mean, if you look at the atrocities in Manchuria, you look at comfort women, none of that was reflected really in the Nuremberg tri Tribunal or in the, in the Tokyo trials. So I would say that that you know, was a watershed moment which did not take on board these issues and which, which really should have because that was also a core component of the atrocities that occurred during the context of the Second World War. So let's fast forward a bit to the 90s. And of course, you had the, the Bosnian conflict in the early 90s, the Rwandan genocide. And emanating from these developments were the first two ad hoc tribunals. So we call them ad hoc because they were set up by the UN Security Council, by UN Security Council resolutions you know, uh, empowered by the charter of the UN. And you had what were called the statutes of these tribunals. So the statute of the ICTY and the ICTR took on board very specifically sexual offenses, including as crimes against humanity, as war crimes. So these were in, encapsulated in what you'd call the, the foundational charter, basically that describes what are the crimes, 
what is the temporal, the time frame of these crimes that are being looked at, who is going to be, um, uh, who, which are the perpetrators that are going to be, um, you know, looked at for the purposes of, of, um, of these war crimes trials. And so this was the first big development which brought on board sexual offenses and sexual violations in conflict into the statute, so into the legal framework per se. Um, and as a result of these two tribunals, you had a number of cases, and I won't go into all of them in detail, but I think just to highlight a few that have developed the interpretation of what it means to have rape as a crime against humanity within the context of the statute. So I think just to keep in mind that you had the statutes and then you had cases that were tried at these tribunals and the case law that's developed at these tribunals has really um, evolved and the jurisprudence of these courts is something that has now, you know, has been taken on board by subsequent cases and, and we'll see how as well. But I would just highlight, for instance, the Forenzia case, which is one of the first cases which really took about, talked about rape as constituting an act of torture as well. You have the Kunarach, which is called the Rape Camp case, which really talked about rape as a crime against humanity as, and as a war crime. Um, so these were very symbolic and these are very uh, important cases that develop the jurisprudence and the thinking along these offenses in the context of international criminal law. Of course, coming from the Rwanda tribunal, one of the first big cases was the Akayosu case, which talked about sexual violence as a crime against humanity, a war crime, but also as a component or an element for the crime of genocide, which again, is, as, as you well know, is, um, you know, is, is quite hard to um, prosecute. And again, the Akayosu case was one of the, the important cases that came out of the ICTR and that was subsequently followed up by other cases as well. And I think in terms of evolution, what it meant to have these cases and the jurisprudence come out from these two ad hoc tribunals is that it then found its way and, and was brought into the discussions uh, around the Rome Statute. And the Rome Statute is really the foundational document for the International Criminal Court. So it's the, the statute that determines what are the crimes and goes into details, you know, in, in Article 7 on crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, how is it defined and how is this prosecuted as well. And of course, if you look at um, specifically sexual offenses, Article 7, which talks about crimes against humanity, has incorporated a lot of the jurisprudence and a lot of the discussions that emanated from the previous two ad hoc tribunals into this foundational legal document as well. So I think the importance of the evolution and development of the law and its final sort of um, incorporation into the statute is extremely important and something that you know a, a lot of authors and, and legal scholars have written about and discussed as well. Um, if you look at Article 7, again, I've just put in a, a, you know, a sort of reference to some of what is in that, in that article as a crime against humanity. You've got Article 6, which talks about genocide, which includes inflicting conditions of life to cause the destruction of a group in whole or in part, also members, uh, measures to prevent births within a group. So you've got multiple sort of components and layers and levels that are incorporated into this foundational legal instrument, which then determines how the International Criminal Court um, cases are sort of brought on board and what are the areas that the prosecution would focus on. So it's really the foundational legal document for, for the um, ICC. I think in terms of, so the International Criminal Court has now been working for close to two decades. And, you know, it has, has had a series of cases before it at different stages. So again, it's a fairly complicated procedure, which looks at, you know, a, a preliminary um, examination of, of a particular situation, which may or may not move ahead to what is uh, an actual investigation, which is a much more in-depth phase of, of a, a, a case, which then moves on to a trial, uh, you know, an, an actual case that you have somebody who, is in the dock who is who's tried and then either convicted or acquitted. Again, you have the possibility also of appeals. Now, I think what's happened in the ICC so far is that 
as in many cases and jurisdictions around the world, the focus has not been really on sexual and gender-based violence. It's not been on conflict-related sexual violence. It's really been on mass atrocities. And in the context of that, CRSV has, in some cases, been incidental and has, you know, has come up in the course of the investigations. But many of the investigations, especially the initial stages, did not focus on that. So this was really peripheral. And if it did come up, it was something that, you know, as, as um, I've indicated, there's a case which was the Luba, Lubanga case, which at a particular point or stage in proceedings, the prosecutor wanted to add charges on conflict-related sexual violence. Hadn't done that at the beginning because that really wasn't the focus. But as the investigation evolved, felt that, you know, we need to include it. And that was not allowed by the court because it was too late, basically. Again, in other cases, there were attempts to introduce new evidence. There were dropping of charges because either it was done too late in the day or there were issues around the evidence. So I think really all a fallout of the fact that this was not something that was one of the, the prime areas of focus from the get-go, from when the cases started. So, which is why they you know, became incidental and then an attempt to bring them on board really didn't work in terms of the procedure of the court as well. So I think you know, a lot to learn and, and correct as well in terms of the initial cases. The really big case that did squarely talk about uh, conflict-related sexual violence was the case of Jean-Pierre Bemba uh, from the Central African Republic. And there was, a, you know, a huge, um, there was a real a sort of appreciation of the fact that this case squarely looked at conflict-related sexual violence as charges against this individual in the context of a command responsibility. So this is somebody who was a commander in chief, so very high up on the, on the, uh, on the, you know, the scale of who was in charge really. And he was convicted in 2016, including on charges of conflict-related sexual violence. And this was seen as a huge victory. It was really seen as one of the first cases at the ICC which tackled this and that had got a conviction. However, what happened was that this case was appealed and Jean-Pierre Bemba was acquitted on appeal in June 2018. And really there were multiple reasons for this, but some of those reasons include issues around, you know, evidentiary, uh, evidentiary concerns included, it included issues around um, how you interpret command responsibility and what his level of responsibility was. And also procedural questions around the appeals chamber um, substituting or doing fact finding in contrast to the trial chamber. So there are multiple issues that come out of this case, but long and short of it is it was seen as initially a great victory and then a setback as well in terms of the, the legal process and you know what, what had to be done. Um, there's one other case, which is the Boscoat Kanda case, which is um, on appeal right now. Again, ha there have been convictions on 18 counts at least of you know, sexual related violence um, in the context of, of the, the ICC charges. But with the conviction in November 2019, this is again gone on appeal. So we have to see how that, that appeal works out. And you know, this is a case to keep an eye on definitely. So I would say overall, there's really been a slow development in the law and sort of few prosecutions with conflict related sexual violence as the focus. You have other charges that have been brought. You've got, you know, context of mass atrocities with conflict related sexual violence sort of as included, but really not as the main focus of, of the prosecutor or of those charges. And I think that's something that, that does need to change as well going forward. I will now come to a slight shift. I mean, so we've talked about what are really individual criminal responsibility uh, mechanisms. So you're talking about international courts, which try individuals for particular crimes, In international crimes that include crimes against humanity, war crimes, potentially genocide. So it's very much on an individual level. So for instance, you know, at any of these uh, trials, you're not talking about the responsibility of a 
a state. You're not talking about the responsibility of a governance structure or the entire apparatus of, of a state. You're really talking about one person and his or her role in the commission of international crimes and whether that person is, is guilty or not of these crimes. However, I think if we pivot, there are a few other sort of um, institutions, courts, that look not at individuals, but look at the broader context. So look at whether a state has undertaken its obligations, whether a state has violated certain obligations that it has you know, uh, un taken on and should be complying with. So I think in that context, let's sort of pivot and look at what, whether the, there are new legal avenues which look at state responsibility, but which might be a means of addressing impunity or a means of getting some accountability. And I, you know, I, I'll focus on the recent case um, that has been brought forward at the International Court of Justice by the Gambia against Myanmar. And I think just a little bit of context is that the um, Gambia filed a case against Myanmar, or filed an application against Myanmar in November 2019. And the basis really was to say that Myanmar is a state party to the Genocide Convention and the Gambia alleges violations of the Genocide Convention, basically, that the state has not done enough and is actively subverting its obligations under this convention. And I think in a very significant move, um, on 23rd of January this year, the ICJ issued what is called a provisional measure. So it's really an interim order of protection while the case sort of evolves and moves on with you know, different procedural requirements. This is one of the first um, big decisions of the court where it actually said that prima facie, there looks like there are violations right now. Of course, you know, the court will decide eventually whether there were violations or not. But in the interim, there are certain things that Myanmar needs to do, including you know, uh, ensure that there's access to evidence, ensure that the evidence is not destroyed, report back to the International Court of Justice on a regular basis to say what it's doing to protect its nationals and, and in particular the Rohingya. So fast forward a little bit to a few weeks ago where as part of the procedures before the International Court of Justice, what can happen is other states can join the proceedings. Again, it's a little technical, you've got two routes, but long and short of it is Canada and the Netherlands issued a joint statement saying, yes, they plan to intervene. So basically to assist the Gambia in this case. And I think what is noteworthy is their specific reference to say, we want to pay special attention to crimes related to sexual and gender-based violence, including rape. So I think here it's going to be a, a very you know, important case to follow as well, to see how Canada and the Netherlands present this. And the fact that focus here is on conflict-related sexual violence as a means of state responsibility. So basically what they're saying is the state has policies that encourage or that per perpetuate conflict-related sexual violence as a weapon of war or as a tool of conflict. And therefore, you know, this is an effort to hold the state responsible for this. So it's, it's an important development and it's going to be an important sort of um, avenue to follow and to look at how this case evolves. Um, just to let you know that, of course, there's a high threshold for a finding on genocide, of course, but this is also the first focus really on the gender component of the genocide convention at the ICJ. The ICJ has dealt with uh, the genocide convention in a few cases earlier, including um, Bosnia versus Serbia, but it's really not addressed this component specifically. So this is really quite a new legal development as well. So I think with that, I'll just come to a few concluding comments to keep to my time as well. Um, I would just say that, you know, there is impunity under domestic law in many cases and many, many jurisdictions. And this has, is being um, addressed to a certain extent in the context of international law, international criminal law as well. I think the one issue that, you know, I, I'm not going to go into detail, but I think is also really important to keep in mind are the allegations in many cases of sexual gender-based violence in a post-conflict scenario by peacekeepers and humanitarians. And I think that's come up a lot also recently. So I think that's something we also need to keep in mind 
when we're looking really at, at impunity and, and domestic law as well. There's a greater role of international courts now, and I think there are more sort of um, efforts to look at other legal avenues and ways of redress to address multiple levels. So you're looking at individual responsibility, you're looking at state responsibility. Again, there, there are many, many levels that you know, we should be thinking of and what are the legal approaches um, when, when we're trying to address this issue of impunity. Um, I think, of course, it goes without saying there needs to be a greater involvement and inclusion of women across the board. So not just when you're talking about women, peace and security, but when you're talking about prosecution teams that are investigating these crimes, where you're looking at you know, a greater sensitization of these um, international crimes across the board at these international courts and institutions as well. And of course, the, the one thing that you know, we all will of course keep an eye on and, and continue to follow is the evolution of international law standards based on case law, based on jurisprudence. So as these cases progress, there's a wealth of legal interpretation and jurisprudence that emanates from them. And that's something that we need to keep up to date with and keep in mind as we're looking at you know, legal avenues on impunity. So I think with that, I will stop and um, yeah, happy to discuss and you know, open it up to, to Swarna and questions as well. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Priya. Uh, I think this is exactly the kind of overview that I was hoping this would be. So for people who um, are interested in the topic, get a little more depth, um, of insight and people who are regular gender talks visitors also have a chance to hear something systematically presented. It was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we're open for questions and it's a small enough group that I think you can just unmute and ask or of course you can leave your question in the chat but while we wait for people to warm up um, I'll give you a question to start with uh, something that I've been thinking about for a long time, you know, that it, I have sort of a, a, a two-part life, right? So there's a part of me that trained in IR, that writes on security. So all of the issues that you talk about are always on my mind. And uh, then there is the part of me that works in a very hyper-local way, creating awareness around gender violence. And I, I'm, there's a much greater consensus around WPS, international law standards, and so on, then there seems to be on the part of states when it comes to domestic acts of sexual and gender-based violence. And um, in given the latter, then what are the prospects of actually realizing the former? It's very ill put, but I think you know what I'm saying. You know, if we can't come, if we can't get rid of impunity domestically, then how far are we, are we going to all be in this position where we sign off on conventions and don't comply? Um, something I really think about because discursively and in the realm of uh, public education and in the realm of uh, advocacy with states who are parties to these documents, I mean, how do you bridge this gap? And yeah. no, I mean, thank it's a question you. in there somewhere. Yeah, no, 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 and I, 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 and I understand exactly where you're coming from. And to be honest, it's something that I think about also quite a lot. I mean, you know, in preparation for this, this discussion today as well, to be honest, what was overwhelmingly on my mind was the Hathras case and UP. And, you know, at some level saying, okay, I'm going to be talking about the international law stuff and the international law related to conflict-related violence, but you've got domestic impunity that seems to be entrenched as well. So, I mean, I don't think there's a, an easy answer, but what I would say is, as you say, it's constant pressure and advocacy on multiple fronts, right? From the ground up, from top down, at the regional level, at the local, hyper-local level. I mean, I, I think in my mind, it would be a few things. One is, of course, and, and it sounds strange coming from me, but that law is not the answer and the panacea and the be all and end all, right? I mean, it has to be from the work that you all are doing, 
changing societal norms, changing views, tackling patriarchy. I mean, those are the very deep rooted, you know, areas that of course there needs to be more focus and work and advocacy. And I think constant engagement. I mean, there's just, it's just um, an area that you can't not constantly engage with. And I think with that, of course, there is the, the legal stuff. So, you know, impunity, why? Is it that the law is not sufficient or is that, you know, in the Indian context 2013, there were a whole lot of legal reforms as well. Is it about implementation? If it's about implementation, what are the issues? What are the challenges? And from my perspective, drawing that also upwards into the international sphere to say, okay, so if this is going wrong and this is not being uh, implemented properly, you're not actually adhering to all the human rights standards that you've said you would, CEDAW, you know, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, those I really look at as legal tools to also pressure and from on top say, you're not complying, you don't have, uh, you know, your obligations are really not being complied with and you need to do something. So that pressure in terms of even advocacy, even in terms of legal avenues. So going to, you know, addressing the Human Rights Committee, all the other institutional avenues to keep that pressure up. So I think it has to be at multiple levels and with all of us playing roles in whatever spheres that we are in and, you know, at, at whichever sort of uh, area that we can provide input and sort of move the discussion forward. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's really complicated, but there, there's a need for a lot more um, input and coordination and collaboration, you know, across the, across sort of all of these levels as well. So again, not sure I totally answered the question, but um, yeah, there's just so much to do, I think, really at the end of the day. No, really, too much to do, too little time. We have a question from Yatra. Can you explain what is the concept of gender analysis and intersectional analysis and how this has been incorporated in investigations and prosecutions of gender crimes internationally? Okay, um, I think, I mean, I, I think if I can address the question in terms of looking at statutes or looking at the law specifically, and then looking at how that um, gets implemented or how that evolves along you know, in terms of prosecutions and in terms of investigations. I mean, I think really one of the issues has been that this is not, this has not been, gender has really not been the focus for many years in the context of international law. And it's only really in the last, you know, I would say two, three decades that you've got a focus on international law by feminist legal scholars that have looked at you know, the lack of incorporation of many of these aspects in international treaties, in, 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 the, in the international law-making process in a way. And I would say that includes, you know, discussions by states when they are negotiating treaties, when they're talking about what treaties um, to adhere to and what are the obligations within these treaties. And that includes, you know, discussions around the international courts. So, I think there was a, a concerted effort by a lot of feminist legal scholars, by a lot of um, activists, advocates, to really ensure that the scale and the gravity of these international crimes were reflected in the statutes. For example, including the ICTY, ICTR, and that this then evolved in terms of case law and jurisprudence into what then was um, discussed and formulated as the International Criminal Court uh, statute, the Rome statute. So I think, I mean, it's, it's and, and, you know, to be also honest, for a lot of lawyers, for a lot of lawyers that work in domestic systems, that work in international systems, there has also been a, a concerted effort by many to engage more with these issues, to engage more with gender analysis, which honestly, in many cases, is not really a focus when you're looking at legal studies and you're looking at, you know, as you evolve in your profession at, at, at prosecutions or investigations. Again, these are issues that have typically not been given a lot of, of uh, focus. And I think, but I think that is changing. And I think there's now a huge effort at the international courts to say, you know, we need to focus on this and we really need to take it seriously and incorporate it into every aspect of decision-making at 
you know, when you're looking at these cases as well, also in terms of reparations, also in terms of victim support. So I think it's, it's, it's been an evolution and it's been a slow process, but I think it's being incorporated much more now than it was, say, 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, Felicia Alphonse asks, with increasing, atroc increasing of atrocities day by day against women, especially the vulnerable sections, no fear of law or state, what would be your view to address this and to stop this? That's a very big question. I mean, I think as I, as I was uh, mentioning to you, Swarna earlier, I mean, I think it's a mix of things. I think it's, it really is empowerment. It's awareness of the fact that you've got these crimes that are occurring, that are you know, being done with absolute impunity as well, with no fear on the part of perpetrators. So I think just, you know, it's, it's um, yeah, I think as citizens, I think what we do need to do is ensure that we don't let up on the fact that you know we know that this is going on so in terms of public support public awareness pressuring the authorities to say no you cannot get away with not prosecuting some of these crimes right so i think there's a, a role for not just the lawyers and not just those who are officials or in in government they have a huge role as well but i think definitely there's a role for everybody else also to play in this to say the and a a, a you know, rule of law that is dysfunctional does not work and that should not be accepted by any of us. And, you know, the, at the end of the day, the last re resort or recourse is, of course, the part to vote and to say that this is not something that, that you are okay with occurring. So, yeah, I mean, I, it's a big, complicated question with multiple answers, I think, to be honest. Yatra reminds you that you haven't answered one part of their question. What is a gender analysis and an internet intersectional analysis? And Shweta, yes, after that, you may unmute yourself and ask. Yatra has a supplementary question. How is this being done in investigations? Uh, and I'll read the others out later. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, I think, as I said, you know, it's it's really a matter of, how the investigations proceed and what the approach is in the investigations itself. So in terms of the, the training that is given, for instance, I mean, I know that at the ICTY, some of the prosecutors, uh, the investigators in the prosecution office were officers who had specific training on gender-based violence, who you know, brought in the information and knowledge and awareness that they had of a gender analysis, of a gender sensitive approach to a lot of these cases, including, you know, these heinous cases of international war crimes as well. So I would say that there is, there has been a, a concerted effort from the international tribunals in the 90s. And that would, you know, that's something that has found its way also within the statutes of the court. So you've got the statute of the International Criminal Court, you've got what are called the uh, rules of procedure of the court as well. So these are all very, very detailed and going to sort of the minutiae of how you would investigate, what is the approach, what, what are the elements that you need to take into account. And I think this is where, again, it becomes important to look at how some of these international legal instruments were discussed and negotiated and whether the specific focus on elements that would be linked to you know, gender-based violence whether they found their way into these statutes and rules of procedure and how, how do you prosecute some of these cases? What are the standards of evidence? What are the um, ways that you, you know, investigate the ways that you get this evidence on board? So there's quite a lot that has been done and there's a lot that still needs to be done, I think. And in terms of a, an effective analysis, it's also at the end of the day, um, how you're gonna prosecute a case. So do you have enough evidence? Do you have evidence that stands up in court? Is it corroborated? What are the standards of evidence? So it really goes into a lot of the minutiae of at the end of the day, how is this case going to be charged and how is it going to be prosecuted? So it's not an esoteric sort of um, assessment of you know, gender in general. It's really very specific in terms of uh, legal appreciation of the facts and how you interpret the law that's been put into these um, statutes. 
Okay, I'm going to read the last follow-up from Yatra and then I really will move on to others because you're getting lots of questions. Um, they want to know how is it reflected in prosecutions internationally? Any cases or judgments you can refer us to where we can see the approach? Yes, of course. Uh, the first one I would say is the uh, Jean-Pierre Bemba case, which is the one that I highlighted in the course of my talk. So take a look at the trial court, uh, the trial chamber decision of 2016. That's really the decision that um, convicted him of multiple counts, but of course, in the context of command responsibility. So as a commander, basically that he had allowed or given these orders and allowed, you know, conflict-related sexual violence to occur and to take place. Of course, as I said earlier, an appeals chamber in June 2018 reversed that decision. So you do need to also look at the appeals chamber decision to then assess on what basis and what were the issues? What were the problems with that 2016 decision? So as I had mentioned, you know, there are issues around evidentiary concerns, but there are also questions around the appeals chamber appreciation of evidence and the appeals chamber substituting its appreciation of the facts for the trial chamber, which generally is not done. So again, a lot of complications and a, a lot of issues around that. Of course, as I also mentioned, the Taganda case in November 2019. So that has been a, a conviction as well, but that is also on appeal. So we'll have to wait and see, you know, where um, where that case comes out. But of course, you know, just to say that there's a whole host of cases also from the ICTY and ICTR. So as I mentioned, the, the Furunzia case, there's the uh, Kunaraj case, there's a the DLO case, there's the Akayesu case. So, you know, I, there are, um, many resources where you'll find case law and you'll find analysis of all these cases, which go into a lot of detail on, you know, the appreciation of, of law and fact in these cases. So, Thank you. Shweta, do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Yeah, so sure. Um, so, hi, uh, I'm Shweta. I'm a student at Korea University, and I first want to say thank you so much for hosting these talks because it has provided me a lot of foundation to like my own interest in gender violence. Um, so one thing me and my peers have always had a lot of reservation towards was the way that the UN has passed a lot of resolutions and a lot of like legal premises and ho hosted a lot of conferences. And there are a lot of these legalities and laws in place, but often, I mean, Rwanda, for example, during their genocide, the peacekeepers were pretty ineffective in actually keeping peace. And there's been a lot of criticism towards the way the UN has actually acted on the resolutions they've passed. So my question is how effective has the UN been and international courts been in actually prosecuting all the cases that you mentioned and kind of bridging the gap between bringing them to court and actually holding them accountable. No, thank you for that. Um, I think there are multiple components to your question. So I think the first thing I'll address is in terms of the international courts. And, and I think your reference probably to the UN's ineffectiveness was more geared towards Bosnia and Srebrenica than Rwanda. So, you know, there were very real concerns about the fact that the UN, the, the Dutch battalion in Srebrenica did not protect the population of Srebrenica and essentially had what was a genocide that occurred in, in the context of Srebrenica. Um, so on that specifically, I would say the UN, as you know, I mean, of course, there are multiple resolutions. There's you know a lot of, of discussion and talking about things. But what did happen in the context of the 90s were these two resolutions that were passed, which did set up these tribunals. Right. I mean, the question subsequently is, of course, how did these tribunals contribute to peace and, and, and in the region? I mean, I, I think that's another discussion for another day. But what I would say is, for instance, the ICTY and the ICTR did actually prosecute a fair number of people. I mean, I don't recall the statistics immediately, but, you know, you've had a number of perpetrators from the Balkans, from Rwanda, for the Srebrenica genocide, for the Rwandan genocide, who have been prosecuted and who have been jailed. So they have been held accountable. And I worked on cases at the ICTY specifically. And I mean, I can tell you that, you know, in interacting with a lot of the survivors and the victims, the one thing that I kept hearing was that we want justice. We want to see some of these perpetrators, you know, held to account. And 
and um, it's it's uh, you know it it was it was it it really was uh, I think the 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 discussion that then moved towards the creation of a tribunal that then did effect prosecutions and then did have accountability. So I think those are two tribunals that I would say there were perpetrators that were held to account. Many of them were in jail. Some still are in jail. Some have been released, you know, in, in the course of serving their, their jail terms as well. Of course, the, the overall sort of overarching emphasis also is not just on individual accountability, but also on the narrative. And I think the discussion of, you know, given that there's a lot of revisionism going on now, how does, how do international judgments or how do court decisions help sort of uh, rectify a narrative that is revisionist right now? And I think, you know, I worked on cases where we went through thousands and thousands and thousands of files of evidence. We heard people in court. We, we corroborated the evidence. We checked the evidence to make sure that it actually measured up to what was being said. So in terms of really having a rule of law process, that then you, uh, you, know, you come out with a conclusion that somebody was responsible for uh, the, the, the commission of some really heinous crimes. I think that in itself has a huge amount of value. So yeah, I mean, I think in general, there's a lot that has come out of these international legal processes. Of course, you have a lot of questions around cost and effectiveness subsequently. I mean, as I said, that's, that's, a, dis that's a whole new discussion as well. So I, I hope I've, I've addressed the, the question. Yeah, yeah, you have. Thank you so much. From Syed, we have this question. Forming an ICT to investigate for crimes against humanity and gender-based crimes requires UNSC approval, which leads to international power play between the nations. How can this be made more independent and less biased? Well, I mean, I would say right off the bat, you actually have an institution that now is not that dependent on the UNSC. You have the International Criminal Court. So, you know, the ICTY and the ICTR, yeah, were a process of negotiation. And I think now with the current UN Security Council, the chances of an ad hoc tribunal, as you say, are probably quite low, depending on, on you know, for which situation, for what you're, what you're looking for a uh, tribunal for. But the, the point is that you've got the ICC. And of course, the question now is who signed on to the ICC? Who are the signatories? And of course, you know, a lot of the big countries have not signed on, especially in our region. So you don't have India, China, you know, multiple other countries. So uh, unfortunately, I mean, some of those avenues are limited or curtailed also based on which states have signed up. But having said that, I'll again come back actually specifically to the Myanmar situation where at the International Criminal Court, there's a, there's a case that's proceeding, which is Bangladesh and Myanmar. And, and here's the interesting part of it. Myanmar has not signed up to the ICC, is not a signatory to the Rome Statute, but Bangladesh is. So what the prosecutor's done is said, well, there are certain crimes that have been committed and that continue to be committed on the Bangladesh side of the border. And because Bangladesh is a state party, therefore we can also investigate things that have come in from Myanmar. And that's something that, you know, the prosecutor, it was a novel new argument she went to a pretrial chamber to say, look, is this okay? Can we proceed on this basis? The pretrial chamber said, yes, go forward. And actually in November, the next phase of the case has started, which is called the investigation phase, where again, you have to go back to a, a, series, a set of judges and they decide whether they can authorize you to proceed with an investigation stage. And they've given that green light. So, you know, there are other ways and, and, and novel legal arguments that you can use to try to ensure accountability. So it's not just dependent on the UN Security Council. That's good to know. Um, Vasha Gopal asks, the use of rape as a war, war weapon still prevalent? Unfortunately, yes. Um, yeah, this is something that we did cover. Um, it's extremely prevalent, including in internal conflicts. So for, you know, and, and including by uh, non-state actors. So the ISIS and the Yazidi women who were, you know, enslaved. Um, you look at the Chibok girls in Nigeria who Boko Haram 
abducted, you know, schoolgirls in, in, in Nigeria who were abducted and, and enslaved as well. So those are non-state actors that have used sexual violence or used rape or, you know, there's a, there's a gamut of crimes. It's not just rape, it's, it's, a, it's a much wider uh, range of crimes. Then of course there is, you know, the most, most recent case in Myanmar, which is again, by all accounts, a systematic use of rape and sexual violence. And, you know, I, I think the one uh, international body that has really documented a lot of this in great detail is a uh, UN, you know, a series of UN experts and the body is called an, the International Fact-Finding Mission for Myanmar, which has concluded its work in 2019 but has come out with very detailed reports. And, you know, just do a Google, you'll find it on the UN website, you'll find their page and you'll find all their reports. And they've spent a large amount of focus in their reports on sexual violence and on conflict-related violence, basically saying that the Myanmar army has used this as a weapon of war and has used sexual violence against men and women to ensure that, you know, the population was uh, forced to flee and would flee across the border into Bangladesh in conjunction with all the other mass atrocities. So unfortunately, yes, it's very much prevalent in internal conflicts as well as in you know, civil wars by non-state actors as well as by state actors. Cute. Uh, Shamila wants to know, can peacekeepers be prosecuted at the ICC? The sexual crimes? Well, I mean, the question of peacekeepers being prosecuted is a, a big can of worms as well. So far, what's happened is all peacekeepers are generally um, viewed as, as, you know, coming from their national jurisdiction. So, for instance, if you had peacekeepers who are either from, from France or, or any other country, that they would, if there are any crimes associated with them, sexual crimes or any other crimes, that they would be uh, prosecuted or they would be investigated within their chain of command so in the army that they are from or, or whichever service and that this would then be looked at from the perspective of national law and if there's an investigation if there's a prosecution it needs to be in con compliance with you know the, the national rules and regulations that would apply to these peacekeepers and that's been the position generally I mean I, I, I think it is also problematic and there needs to be uh, a view or a, an approach to ensure that accountability does happen because what's happened in many of these cases is national authorities basically say no we you know we, we don't have either enough proof or the peacekeepers have been moved out already and that a lot of these cases don't follow through in terms of prosecution so I, I think it's it is a big problem. From Syed, we have another question. In terms of equality and justice for non-binary, gender conforming, the discrimination and violence is still rampant in so many countries with no laws even recognizing them, leave alone protecting them. There are huge social movements that are happening across countries, which are a good way to bring attention. But how can the UN or international community pressurize or how can they be pressurized for adopting it into a law and abiding by it? Okay, I think in terms of, I'm not sure if I've totally understood the question, but I think my, uh, my understanding of it is you're basically asking about sort of the uh, non-binary gender LGBTIQA communities and greater protection, if I understand correctly. Well, I mean, I, I think that's really a mix of multiple approaches right so one is it has to be as you say there are huge social movements occurring across countries so the reflection of those social movements into domestic law in terms of protection by the law and greater protections also of course the converse of non-discrimination that you ensure that whatever you have in the law you know you ensure that that it does not discriminate against people as well i mean so i think a lot of principles that emanate from international human rights law are very relevant. I think there are also, you know, other pressure points to apply. For instance, there's a UN special rapporteur on uh, LGBT rights as well. So bringing up a lot of these issues before him or her, you know, that's another uh, approach that you can look at in terms of um, 
the international community and, and wider awareness of the international community as well. So, I mean, I, I think there are multiple routes and approaches as well, but I think also important to use what we have. So if you've got the ICCPR, which says non-discrimination, then use that aspect of international human rights law, which has been, um, you know, which has evolved and you've got what are called general comments that actually interpret specific aspects of each of these um, conventions. And that, you know, that is what you can use also as pressure points. Of course, the last thing I would say is bringing some of that international jurisprudence into domestic law. So we've got cases, for example, Vishaka at the um, you know, Supreme Court. We've got cases that have, have looked at international law and incorporated that into the domestic law as well. So, yeah, I mean, I think there are multiple approaches and multiple pressure points to use outside the law and also within the framework of domestic and international law. Any other questions? Actually, you can now at this point just unmute yourselves and uh, speak. It's a very small group. It's a, this thing of uh, bringing together the international and the domestic, the other side of it, and this is something that I th think about and I talk about often, is also making the international relevant. And like when you're doing a session like this, supposing we were to be doing it in a college or something, for me to talk about, all of this sounds so distant. Um, to most people, think, well, why should I know about this? Because it's not going to happen in Kodambakam or in Trichy or in some locality in Tirvanantapuram. Of course, we know it is. But um, when we talk about the international conventions and laws and norms, they seem very removed and irrelevant. What's the, um, I mean, this, I guess I, I'm just obsessed with making that link between the two, because this is what I do. But uh, yeah, just leave it back out there to... No, absolutely. So, no, I mean, I, I think for me, that's been sort of part of the ongoing struggle and discussion. And, and I think yeah. for me, in the last few years, I've consciously written a lot in domestic publications. So, you know, in an Outlook and, and the Hindu and stuff, to try to bring that... Yes. Right to say, look, you've yeah. got all this. There's a wealth of information, jurisprudence, which does have direct relevance, but we just need to know how to pull that into the domestic as mm -hmm. well. And and I think for me, that's also critical. It's that you yeah, know, I look at them as leverage and tools that you can use in domestic advocacy, in you know, at courts. I mean, there are multiple ways, and and it goes both ways. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at a lot of the, the jurisprudence, a lot, a lot of the discussions, again, at the international level, it's also heavily influenced by what happens in the domestic and constitutional courts. So there's that, you know, up and down sort of relationship yeah. as well. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think we need to definitely talk more about it, make those connections much more, and, and really see what are the ways that we can expand, you know, the scope of of what the aims are. Like, what are we looking to achieve? Are we looking to achieve non-discrimination? Are we looking to achieve certain protections? What is the tool or the, the set of tools that we have in our repertoire? And how do we use each of these? And in different mm -hmm. ways. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's actually very exciting in terms of making these connections mm -hmm. and trying to influence, you know, both spheres yeah. in a way. Yeah. And I think there's a Venn diagram where they do intersect. And I think that's the that's the the really interesting mm -hmm. part as well. Mm -hmm. And you're right too that it, this goes beyond the law because, you know, you have governments that are apparently impervious to the to just how prolific and common gender based violence is around them, who might even justify it as being part of the local culture, but that will in international settings make speeches with the appropriate noises. So how do you, you know, why, how do you make that either percolate? Or how do you change it from so that it's more substantial? And I think 
this is a challenge that in societies or in political systems that are not built for um, lobbying and advocacy, where the access of civil society and the citizen to uh, a dialogic space with government is so limited. It's actually something that we have to think about. And then we go back to the law because then you go back to PILs and you go back to repetitions to push the envelope just a little bit. No, absolutely. And I think also, as you say, in terms of that space, I mean, I, th I think this is where the role of civil society and, and domestic civil society is critical. So, for example, when you have the universal periodic review process, the UPR process that goes mm -hmm. on at the UN, or you've got treaty bodies, so the nine treaty bodies that look at either, you know, racism or look at uh, discrimination against women or torture, you know, one of the nine, when they are looking at a country report, the fact that civil society organizations from within the country act as a fact check or basically say, no, the government has said this, no, this is not correct. This is a fact check. You know, this is what we're presenting before the committee. I mean, I think that's exactly that space that is critical. But as you say, I mean, I think that space can also be um, a bit distant and a bit opaque as well mm -hmm. to, to sort of understand. Yeah. And, and I think that's where, you know, it needs to be. And not necessarily entirely democratic within itself. Exactly, exactly. And I think that needs to be democratized much more. And there need to be less gatekeepers in those systems as well. So I think, you know, as you say, I think we're all chipping away at those those sort of barriers. And yeah, and you've got to keep on. I mean, there's, there's no option, as you well know. I mean, as you're doing every day. So. As we're trying to do all of us, I think. Uh, trying not to get overwhelmed by the things that need to be done. Absolutely. Absolutely. In the times in which we live. Absolutely. Well, I don't see other questions, so I'm just going to thank you with all my heart and um, hope that we can do something more and do it soon. You know, uh, to follow up on this in a sense, but also to build on it and build around it and uh, take it for forward wherever we wherever we want, in many different directions. So thank you so much, Priya, uh, for making the time at a very awkward time of day for you. And thank you, everyone who attended this session and asked questions. And uh, we hope you'll come back. We do this every month, second Saturday, same time, 10.30 IST, finish up just about 12 o'clock. Um, we are not meeting in November because it happens to fall on the Pavali. But we will be back in December and we will have a gender talk that will also be part of our 16 days campaign calendar at that point. And we are hoping to have uh, the founder of a sister organization in Kolkata that has been working in the area of domestic violence speak to us on that day. So I hope you'll all be there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Priya. Thank you, Swarna, and for the fantastic work that you all are doing. And you know, look forward to staying in touch. And, and thank you to everybody for your questions as well. <laughs>